Thank you so much for joining me today on Just Praise Him Radio. I'm your host, Glenda Lomax, and my job is to inspire you to a closer walk with Christ. Now here's the show. Hello, believers. Welcome to the Just Praise Him radio program. I'm your host, Glenda Lomax, and the title of my message today is Overcoming Hard Circumstances. I think many of us are going through tests and trials right now and can relate. I know I can. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Revelation 2 verse 7. So I want to talk to you about overcoming. In particular, overcoming hard circumstances, because this is something we all need to understand so we can put it into practice whenever we are faced with hard times, whether that's now or later. And many are already going through those hard times. And when the economy, you know, as it continues to downturn, there's going to be more. From Revelation 2, verse 7, we can clearly see that overcoming is something the Lord wants us to do. So let's get a good understanding of what it is so we can pursue it. What does it mean to overcome? The Strong's definition of overcome is to conquer. The King James uh, Version Dictionary definition of overcome is to conquer, to vanquish, to subdue or liken to overcome enemies in a battle, to surmount, to get the better of, or as to overcome difficulties or obstacles. Do you have things you need to conquer in your life? Abuse, addictions, attitudes, bad habits, bad language, sins? You know, I'm always shocked when I hear a Christian speak profanity, and you would be surprised how many still do. That's a bad witness for the Lord, y'all. If there was ever a time we needed to be overcoming all of that, it is now. Now when we are about to be called home. We don't want any sin on our records, do we? Okay. Because what happens if we have sin on our records? We get left behind to be refined in the Great Tribulation, and we don't want any of that. It seems to me there's always a key to whatever you need to overcome, and that if you find that one key, you can accomplish anything. Many people who have gone on to lose large amounts of weight will tell you it was this or it was that that helped them. They found the key, and they lost weight, and they were victorious over it. I want to read y'all something. Let me pull it up. It's about overcoming hard things. Okay, it's called We Can Overcome. Take, for example, Egyptian hieroglyphics. In seminary, this is a story you guys telling, I had plenty of brilliant folks for classmates, just amazing people. One man, Kevin, was with us on our trip to the Holy Land. Kevin finishing his Master's of Divinity at Princeton and was soon on his way to Harvard for a Ph.D. in Biblical Languages. Kevin knew the standard Greek, Hebrew, Latin, German, French, Spanish, and, I don't know how you pronounce this one, Ugaritic or something like that. I never heard of that one. But, but in his spare time, Kevin taught himself Aramaic and Egyptian hieroglyphics. Egyptian hieroglyphics? This guy could read the stuff on the tombs and temples in Egypt. How cool is that? In fact, at one point, he got into an argument with an Egyptian guide in Luxor about the meaning of a text. The guide became furious and then broke out in laughter. Kevin was the first person in 30 years of being a guide who could read the hieroglyphics. They were inseparable after that. Kevin said that in the past, it was assumed that each glyph or picture stood for an idea or a whole thought. Wavy lines were assumed to mean water, a round disc to mean the sun, and an image of a bird flying meant flight. However, scholars now know that each glyph or picture stands for a sound. For example, the image of a round disc stands for the sound Ra. It turns out that Egyptian hieroglyphics are just a complicated ancient alphabet. Egyptian hieroglyphics are simply ancient Egyptian Coptic language written. Kevin said that all he had to do was learn Egyptian Coptic and then Egyptian hieroglyphics were easy. Yeah, I'm sure that was a piece of cake. So, we all have things that we have to overcome in this life, don't we? When I had to 
overcome an abusive marriage, the key was I had to want a better life more than I wanted to stay with the love of my life, who was also the person I most feared. I had to be fully committed to making a new life, and I had to believe that I could. There is a key anytime you need to overcome something. When I had to overcome debilitating pain in my then degenerative lower spine years ago, when I was in a terrifying wilderness, the key was I had to learn to focus on something else, even as the pain screamed at me for hours on end. When I had to overcome my terror of the uncertainty of the wilderness walk the Lord put me in back then, I learned the key was I had to keep my focus on how much I trusted our faithful God to provide for me and my son. In all these things, I was able to overcome when I found the key. Often overcoming is just changing your focus. That is a word for somebody. The Lord says you, sir, want to overcome and not take those drugs you feel you have to take to function. The Lord says to you, man of God, am I not the mighty Jehovah? Am I not he who died and rose again from the dead to live forevermore? Is anything too hard for me? He said you are trying to do this in your own power. He says to you, if you will only give it to me, I will do it for you. I will deliver you. How much do you trust me? Trust me now and be free. Okay, moving right along. I was not expecting to get a word. Uh, Oh, I'm getting something for a woman. You're not old, but you're not in your 20s either. I believe you are a light-skinned black woman. You're pretty. You wear your hair about shoulder length. I feel there are children there with you, but I, I can't see them or how many. You are struggling with lack, and I see the vulture of lack. The vulture of a lack is a demonic um, force. It's, I've never seen it before, but now, before now, but my friend John W. Morgan saw it back in the early 2000s on me when I lived in Dallas and was really struggling to pay my bills. The vulture of lack is there pecking at everything in your life and eating up your, all your abundance. The door it came into your life through is only halfway open. I can see the door. And you know, y'all. The devil only needs a little crack to slip into our lives, right? Just a little crack. I believe that halfway open door means that there is compromise or sin in your walk. Maybe you are not all out sinning and doing everything you, your, your flesh wants to do, but you're kind of halfway sinning. The door I see is a doorway inside your house, and it's pretty dark in your house, which means the spiritual atmosphere is not as godly as God would like it, or else it's, there's residence in the house. The door looks like either a bedroom or bathroom door, which is a clue to where the sin is. I see in the spirit that you can close the door and make the vulture leave. The Lord says if you will commit and overcome the sin, that he will show you how to overcome the poverty. Your choice. We all have areas of sin we need to overcome, don't we? All of us, because none of us are perfect, so we know we do. One area we especially need to stay on top of is forgiving others. It is so easy to hold a grudge or be in unforgiveness and be angry and resentful towards someone. And if you don't feel like you're doing something very wrong when you're doing it, but you are doing something wrong enough to keep you out of heaven, so it is wrong. Matthew six twelve and forgive us our debts as we for as we forgive our debtors. We are supposed to forgive others as we have been forgiven. Only if you want to go to heaven, though, if you don't want to go to heaven, it doesn't matter. Remember the parable of the unforgiving servant, because if you don't forgive, you will be turned over to the tormentors. And that happens in this life as well as after. So I'm just telling you. Overcomers are forgivers. We overcome evil with what? With good. That's right. You know, the easiest way I've ever found to avoid unforgiveness is when somebody does something really hurtful to you, turn around and do something really good for them. It keeps the unforgiveness from taking root in you. Plus, it sometimes helps the other person be a little nicer too. Sometimes not, if they're just an ugly person, but sometimes it helps. So let's talk about some of the things we need to be sure we overcome in this time because none of us want to be left behind in the Great Tribulation for refining, do we? It's not going to be pretty then, y'all. It's bad now, but it's going to be way worse then. And that time's going to start. It can start any time now. We need to overcome our flesh's desire for resentment and revenge. The desire for revenge will eat you up from the inside out. Can I just tell you that? It will eat you night and day, and it will steal all your peace and all your joy. 
We need to overcome unforgiveness in every instance so we don't get left out of heaven. Nothing and nobody and nothing that anybody ever did to you, and I don't care how long it went on or what it was, is worth missing heaven. Please hear me on this. I am trying to help you. I have to remind myself of this too, y'all. People hurt me just like they hurt you. People do ugly things to me and say ugly things to me. We just have to let it go. It's not worth it. We're going to heaven after this if we do things right. We need to overcome any evil in our lives and any evil coming against us with good and with love, with his love flowing through us. This takes practice, but it does make you feel wonderful when you accomplish it. I'm not saying you don't have a good reason to hate some people. I do too, but we are commanded not to. Who do you want to rule in your life and in your heart, your fleshly desire or your God? Because whichever one you let rule, that's the one you're going to be given to. And let me give you a clue. The fleshly desires is owned by Satan. We need to overcome our hearts dragging us into all sorts of trouble. This is a bigger issue for the young than it is for us older people usually. But we need to get a, a hold on that. At any age, you must whip your rebellious flesh into shape using the word of God. Do not let it keep sinning. Don't allow it to. You're the boss of it. The head rules the body. We must overcome thinking that we have to have our own way all the time. You know, many people idolize their own way. They think they are so smart and so this and so that and so educated and so beautiful and so whatever else, so wealthy, so whatever, that their way is the only way. And that is called pride, by the way. And it will cause you to be left behind in the great tribulation for a long season of refining. And let me tell you, it is ugly being refined to get the pride out of you. That's usually the first thing that God goes after when he puts you into refining. And even if you have a little bit, he'll dig it out. And it's painful. That happened to me when I was in that first wilderness. <laughs> I, re I remember talking to John Morgan about it. And I said, he said, I don't even see any pride in you. I said, well, it's in there somewhere because he's after it, I'm telling you. And I said, it hurts, man. It really hurts. And John's like, I don't even see it. And I'm like, well, he does. God sees it. And if God sees it, he's coming for it because you're his child. We must overcome thinking that we can treat God any kind of way and he will jump to our aid when we are in trouble. And y'all, I'm not one of the people that thinks that, but there's a lot of people out there that do. He will not compete for your time and attention. He will just stand at a distance from you waiting for you to see the error of your ways. If you're ignoring him all the time and running with the world, and then the minute you're in trouble, you're like, oh God, come save me with this. No, he's going to go, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I never heard you. I don't even know your name. You don't even come to me every day. He's not going to know who you are. Depart from me. I knew you not. We have to put things in the right order. We have to give things the right priority. We have to give people the right priority. We have to give God the right priority, most of all, because he is first. If he is God, he's first. If he's not first, then he's not your God. And you better be looking at your life to see what really is your God and who really is in you. That is a word for somebody. God said there's a woman listening, and you have put the man in your life in God's place. Ooh, woman of God, you better get that fixed quick. That will get you hurt. You better get that fixed. That is not in my notes, by the way. If you make room for God, he will show up. If you don't make room for God, or if you give somebody else his place, he won't show up, okay? All right, moving right along. I have a dog named Simba. I named him Simba because he's the color of a lion, and he has the big personality of a lion, even though he's a small dog. One afternoon, several years ago, we were really tired, and I decided to take a quick nap, and so I was taking Simba with me. And Simba has a certain place on the bed beside me where he always lays. I had laid something on the bed in his place earlier, not thinking about it when I was doing housework. To a dog, if you put something of yours on their place, it means they are not allowed there. That's how dogs show other dogs what is theirs and where their territory is. When I moved what was in his place, he moved closer to me. As I watched it, it occurred to me, that's how God is. Anytime we move what is in his rightful place in our hearts and in our lives, he will move into that area and fill it with his glorious self. But anytime we prefer our busyness, our activities, our sin or wrong relationships over him, he will stay out. 
Can I just tell you, you don't want that, especially in this time. And let's remember that if we push him out with all our wrong stuff and people, he may not be close enough to hear and answer us when the trouble shows up, which it's going to start doing shortly. We don't know what day. One of the meanings of overcoming is to conquer. Let me read you a story about conquering. Y'all like this. Overcoming locked gates, tall fences, and snapping dogs presents a challenge for us meter readers in rural Oklahoma. This is a story I found online. Where we are required to read all meters. No estimates are allowed. One time, a co-worker succeeded in getting past a particularly vicious watchdog tied to a chain that was long enough to give him sway over the entire backyard and driveway. Later, the man was questioned by his superior. How were you able to get past that watchdog? And the, custo- the customer was curious. He said, that's easy, boss. He said, I parked on his chain. <laughs> I like that. That's a good story. I parked on his chain. We need to park on the devil's chain. Researching, I found many true stories of overcomers. This one, however, stands head and shoulders above the rest. The next time I have a bad day, I'm going to remember this guy. No, it's not that bad. From the age of five, Jerry was the victim of a series of strange and agonizing accidents. While holding an axe overhead, it slipped and cut a cleft into his chin. While a sophomore in high school, he backed into an electric lathe. That makes my skin... uh, When he was 17, he had an accident with a double-barreled shotgun. Both barrels went off and their loads smashed into his right forearm. He chipped a vertebra in his neck and had to have an operation. He suffered a detached retina. He broke his ankle. A non-malignant growth the size of a grapefruit was removed near his stomach. Holes developed in his intestines caused by a four-inch sliver of wood which had been in him for 12 years. I don't even know how that could happen. His name is Jerry Kramer. He overcame all of these adversities to play offensive tackle on the Green Bay Packers football team. He was on the 1965 team that won the NFL title and on the team that won the historic first Super Bowl game the next year. That's pretty cool, huh? Whew, he had a lot of bad days. Here's some more shorter ones. Johnny Fulton was run over by a car at the age of three. He suffered crushed hips, broken ribs, a fractured skull, and compound fractures in his legs. It did not look as if he would live, but he would not give up. In fact, he later ran the half mile in less than two minutes. Walt Davis was totally paralyzed by polio when he was nine years old, but he did not give up. He became the Olympic high jump champion in 1952. Talk about overcoming. Lou Gehrig was such a clumsy ball player that the boys in his neighborhood would not let him play on their team, but he was committed. He did not give up. Eventually, his name was entered into baseball's Hall of Fame. Woodrow Wilson could not read until he was 10 years old, but he was a committed person. He became the 28th president of the United States. At the age of seven, he had to go to work to help support his family. At nine, his mother died. At 22, he lost his job as a store clerk. At 23, he went into debt and became a partner in a small store. At 26, his partner died, leaving him a huge debt. By the age of 35, he had been defeated twice when running for a seat in Congress. At the age of 37, he won the election. At 39, he lost his re-election bid. At 41, his four-year-old son died. At 42, he was rejected for a land officer role. At 45, he ran for the Senate and lost. At 47, he was defeated for the nomination for vice president. At 49, he ran for Senate again and lost. At 51, he was elected President of the United States. During his second term of office, he was assassinated, but his name lives on among the greats in U.S. history, Abraham Lincoln. Those are good stories, aren't they? You know, I think a lot of us are going through really hard times right now. I know I am, and I know some of you are because I've talked to you. I think when we are suffering, we have a tendency to get down because we're human and we don't want to be suffering. Suffering's not fun. And it's hard not to, you know, dwell on your dwindling finances, your aching body, your loneliness, or the uncertainty you feel. And I think we really have to guard against Satan dragging us down at these times or getting us into hopelessness. If he can, he'll try to get you into self-pity, which is even harder to get out of. Not that it's not human to feel bad, not that your situation isn't bad, but 
that if you open the door and invite any of these in, a nest of demonic forces begins to gather and they will all begin attacking you at once. And they will make you feel far worse and you will suffer far more. One of my closest friends recently wrote me. She said, I went through a phase of God, come and get me, come and get me. Y'all, I've gone through those phases too, even recently. And ended up getting attacked really bad by the enemy. That's when Satan attacks you most is when you're down and she's so right. The last few bad attacks, I ended up losing a few teeth, getting a broken rib, and my back hurting so bad it was like the lower part of my body was detached and wouldn't move when I wanted it to. He does attack us worse when we're down, because he can. Satan will kick you when you're down. My friend Cheryl, who had heard about my sister being ill, talked in a letter she mailed with her contribution about how we are all getting hit on multiple fronts, and she wrote something so elegantly. She said, Glenda... Life feels so overwhelming. I'm so glad we have Jesus. He's our peace, joy, hope, provider, protector, comforter, strength. He will see us through. He will pick us up when we fall, give us a hug, and help us continue on the journey. We're almost there. It can get scary and hard to keep going and heartbreaking, but we have Jesus. We're almost home. That's the best part, y'all. We're almost home. Keep doing what you are called to do, and I will do the same. Be encouraged as you have encouraged others. What she wrote encouraged me. That's why I wanted to share it with you. What a beautiful, encouraging note. We know we have Jesus, but sometimes when our lives are in shambles and the devil is screaming in our face, we need to be reminded, don't we? We need to be reminded that if all the prayer we can muster is, Jesus, please help, he will answer us. He is well acquainted with the griefs of this earthly life. Whatever you're going through right now, I pray that he's right by your side and he's holding you up and he's making sure that you have enough and he's getting you through it. We may not have all the answers, but we know who does and he'll get us there. And he saw all this long before it happened, y'all. That's all I have for y'all today. I hope this podcast has been a blessing to you. Jesus bless you. Thanks for listening. Y'all have a great week. Hang in there. This too shall pass. It is going to get better. It's not too long before we'll all be up in heaven drinking coffee together, okay? Thank you so much for tuning in today to Just Praise Him Radio, sponsored by the friends and supporters of JPH. You can contact me by mail at my new address, Glenda Lomax, JPH Inc., P.O. Box 854 Altus, that's A-L-T-U-S, Oklahoma, 73522, or by email at jphtoday at gmail.com. Don't forget to visit the website for prophetic updates at wingsofprophecy.blogspot.com. JPH is not affiliated with any nonprofit organization, church, or denomination. Have you ever gone through a time in your life where suddenly it just felt like your whole life was falling apart? I call these experiences the wilderness experiences. Wilderness experiences are a time of great uncertainty and change. Uh, There are times when our faith is tried and refined. After many experiences, the Lord spoke to me to write The Wilderness Companion, which is a virtual roadmap through the desert times of your life. Find out why you've been led to the wilderness. Find out what the biggest hindrance is to receiving provision in the wilderness. Find out what the seven temptations of the wilderness are. Drastically cut the time you spend in the wilderness by learning how to partner with the Lord instead of working against Him. Every Christian needs to read The Wilderness Companion. It's by Glenda Lomax and it's available on Amazon.com or WingsOfProphecy.com. Amazon.com, The Wilderness Companion by Glenda Lomax.